If you look at the Chesapeake Bay, obviously one big problem is sea level rise and all kinds of activities with boats going up and down the bay that has resulted in uh, shorelines being modified and some of them being lost and trees falling into the bay. In the Chesapeake Bay, we know that a lot of the shorelines have been hardened, almost 18% at the last estimate. When shoreline is hardened either by riprap revetment um, or by bulkheads, you know, you lose the fringe marsh that was there. The stone's not necessarily bad, but we've really altered the ecological integrity between land and water, which is a very rich zone for terrestrial organisms and aquatic organisms. It's because there's no plant material, they're totally exposed. So the temperature near those replements are much warmer, there's no shade at all, and they're devoid of life because there's no plants. So you aren't going to see a lot of fish or anything else for that matter. Knowing that we have a lot of private landowners in the Chesapeake Bay, and knowing that a lot of them do have riprap revetments, we were trying to think of a way that we could retrofit some of these shorelines. Still allow homeowners to keep their um, security of, of rock and naturalize the rock with plants. By integrating vegetation in them and bring back some of those ecological benefits that you lost when you lost the, the fringe marsh. So this green riprap project started in 2013 and we took uh, the design from a spot along the Magathy River where plants had naturally colonized the spaces between riprap stone. And we said, huh, maybe we can speed up that process and do this everywhere there's stone along uh, the shoreline. The green riprap is actually a retroactive process. And so the idea is that the plants that are in the marshes bring a lot of benefits. They provide habitat, they improve water quality. When we put rocks on our shoreline, you lose a lot of those benefits. So the idea is that by putting plants back in those rocks, we can bring some of those benefits back and hopefully improve the kind of habitat that that shoreline provides. We have undertaken about eight of these projects. Um, and they're all in various stages of development, uh, maturity. Um, we've had some failures, we've had some successes, so we've, we've learned a lot along the way. And I live in Round Bay. I've been here since 2010, and I'm on the board here. My responsibility is stormwater management and erosion control, and I happen to be a watershed steward. I became a watershed steward because of that responsibility. And in 2013, we partnered with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, organization and we planted 600 uh, plants here. Now before the plants were here we simply had riprap and it was a uh, bare riprap. So this was a pilot project that we undertook back in 2013. It was actually run by our Dynamo intern Christine Carpenter who was uh, our first intern through the Chesapeake Conservation Corps program and she set up the whole thing, we designed it, uh, she rallied a whole bunch of volunteers, mostly young kids, a lot of them were for the, from the summer camp here at Round Bay, and they installed the plants. I got involved with this because I live here, um, and when we showed up, I guess about 10 years ago, there was nothing planted here. Basically jammed uh, quart pots of Spartina Peyton's alternaflora and switchgrass in between the rock voids. And it took a couple years, but by 2015, you could really see a difference in the shoreline here. The plants took hold, and then they began trapping sediment that was moving along the shoreline. And all this beach here is built up, um, in many cases, because of the plants that were put in. Over time, the community has had community planting days and different projects, and they've come out here and they put these little teeny plugs in here, and now we have this. We planted the grasses in patches all along this couple hundred feet of shoreline, including around the corner, and then it it, once it got established, it really took off and created this dense uh, fringe marsh here. Community actually is participating now with the SRA, the Severn River Association, and we're seining every other week. And we're seining at three locations along the shoreline, and we're measuring the life species that we're finding, from eels to, to fish, and we're measuring them. And we're gonna be doing that through October. So what do you guys think? You like this? This is another green riprap project that we did in 2013. This was pretty much bare rock. There were a few uh, high tide bushes that had colonized the upper part of the rock. We had another volunteer planting where we shifted the rocks around, 
put the plants in. As you can see, it's really taking off. This is the headwater of a shallow creek that uh, was once a uh, white cedar swamp. So uh, we're, we're doing the best we can to keep it alive with native plants. The mallow, mm -hmm. we planted switchgrass, uh, we planted spartina, although it's hard to see with the shrubs that have come up. It's win-win for us, it's win-win for the, for the river and, and all the creatures. So the Gibson Island community was very interested in not just having a standard, hardened look to their shoreline. So they challenged uh, Bayland Engineering to do something different. So this is what Baylands came up with and uh, it's been very successful. So in a typical rock revetment project along a shoreline, all you would see here is white rock from the toe down at the bottom all the way up to the top of the hill. Um, as you can see, this is where the rock actually starts. You can barely see the rock now since it's covered with vegetation and goes all the way down to the shoreline. This area was filled with sand and small pea gravel. They, they washed it into the rock voids and then they planted uh, several species of native plants. And over time, there's been many, many more species of plants that have colonized. It's, it's hard to even see the rock as you look down the shoreline here. Back in 2015, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, working with the Gibson Island Community Association, they wanted to naturalize this rock right here, this revetment. We actually filled the voids in this rock with sand. We washed it in with buckets of water, and then we planted the voids with uh, spartina. We were a little disappointed with this project. We came back a year later and much of the sand had washed out and many of the plants have washed out, but as you can see, some of them took hold and are now growing in the rock spaces here along the, the bottom of the rock. See the Spartina alternate flora at the base of the rock there that we planted. And uh, this is high tide bush that naturally colonized. Um, the community association just lets this grow, which is kind of nice. So the shoreline here was, um, revetment was put down back in around 2010. They filled the voids with sand and pea gravel and planted it. And, you'd be hard pressed to see any rock in there. It's, it's, it's completely naturalized. Plants take up nutrients as they grow. So if you have enough plants, they can actually remove a fair amount of nutrients from the water. We really need plants to hold uh, the soil and to prevent the sediment from creating, increasing the turbidity that we see. Inputs of nitrogen and phosphorus into the waterways. Which is really harmful to things like crabs and fish. And what type of plant you use depends on where you're located in the bay. The reason I'm involved in, in this activity related to green riprap is because of the work we've done with Phragmites. Very friendly little wetland plant that's exploding all around the country and we've been doing wetland research at the Smithsonian with collaborators of all sorts for a long time trying to understand what is it that has allowed this plant to just go crazy across North America. Uh, how it gets there, what's the biology and ecology behind it. So they basically thought we would have something to say about is it good if you have Phragmites or is it bad? And, and I think it's not a very good idea. But with riprap, because that's a human disturbance, when you put that stuff on the landscape, you increase the probability that something like Phragmites is going to become established because the seeds get dispersed there in the water and with the wind. So from a management perspective, once riprap goes in, you really need to be cautious and not let the Phragmites come in. Here in Maryland, in many of the projects that we've done, we've used a lot of different species. We've got some, some high marsh plants and some low marsh plants, um, and we've used Spartana alterniflora and Spartina patens. Closer in, we put in the, the Spartina patens, which needs a little bit of a break from the water, and we also have a lot of panicum here, which is switchgrass. And we love switchgrass. It has a, a 10 foot um, root, so it's a really great soil stabilizer. We've also liked to integrate some pollinator species in there, like seaside goldenrod, um, which is Solidago, some Perverans, um, and some marshmallow as well. Well, a biodiversity is a, a, a good thing. Why? Because if you look across my shoulder at this wetland, there are a lot of things flowering now, and that's providing food and resources for a whole variety of insects. So the biodiversity of that group of animals is really benefiting from native species. Through shading, through litter, 
And there's even some evidence that frag might even produce some chemicals that aren't friendly toward native plants. Those things all together mean that once Phragmites takes over an area, it basically lights out for native species. So in riprap areas, what we want to do is keep the Phragmites from coming in because that would preclude any other plants from surviving or even growing in areas like that. So you, you've got a, a good mix of native plants, and I'm sure over time there'll be more native plants colonizing the site. So I see uh, Spartina patens down on the higher end of the high tide. There's uh, Spartina alterniflora. There's high tide bush. Uh, you have this trumpet creeper vine that has colonized kind of the upland area. You have seaside goldenrod. So over here we have a young persimmon tree that's colonized the spaces between the rock. And this tree won't get very tall. It's a, it's a small tree and it, it provides, uh, the fruits provide great habitat for uh, many things, many species of wildlife. We have an old concrete block bulkhead that was built in the early 1960s. It was failing, it was going to fall, and if it did, then I was afraid that we would lose most of this hill to erosion. The fish and wildlife folks were able to uh, get a source for plants, and they brought some out today to do sort of a demonstration. We have a nursery grow out uh, the marsh grass in a coconut fiber pot. This allows the roots to get established and start growing out even through the pot. That way when you plant it, they're ready to grip onto that rock and get established really quickly. The staining on the rock indicates your high water mark here. And the Spartina patens and the marsh hibiscus grow right at that high tide line and the Spartina alterniflora, which is down here, will grow from the mid-tide line to the high-tide mark. Take your plant in the coconut fiber pot. Find a good space in the rocks where you think you can wedge it in. You just wedge it in like this and then you might have to rearrange some rocks over it so that it doesn't wash away with the tides. This took us about 20 minutes to put these plants in here, and over time, uh, if we put them in the right spot, they will grow and spread and begin to cover the rock with green. So the next thing we'd like to do is to expand the use of these green riprap um, to more shorelines and see how they function and if there are um, maybe different characteristics in terms of plants and that kind of thing um, in different areas that we need to experiment with. The few places that I've seen where they actually have, have done work on green riprap, I think it has huge potential. It really just requires a change in the paradigm about how the people that build those things construct them to provide the opportunities to put plants in them and then subsequent to that the follow-up management so that you don't let things that you don't want to grow not get there. And so these are great community projects. It's easy to plant in riprap because you have natural pockets so you can naturally and little hands are perfect for this so kids are great at this so you can simply plant them in the pockets of the riprap which is great fun. If the community makes the commitment to come out on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning it's an easy job to do, kids can do it, because you're putting little plugs in between the rocks, and bam, they grow. But it's a, a very user-friendly approach um, to greening up your shoreline. It brings all kinds of wildlife. We see bees galore, which is really fun. I think um, one of the best things about it is the animals and things that come to these shorelines when there's more greenery on them. When there are no other choices to stabilize a shoreline, such as a living shoreline, we think that they should incorporate planting the rock with this green riprap technique. So I think if you enjoy the waterfront, then this is a great opportunity to bring some of the benefits of um, living on the waterfront you know, out into your property. Thank you.